Okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction, which I, I, I didn't hear, but I, I'm sure it was great. So um, this talk is, is very nicely following uh, Jason's talk and introduction about compressed sensing and the discussion on, on spread spectrum, etc. So it's indeed entitled Sparsity Averaging Related Analysis, or shortly, SARA. And it's about the novel reconstruction algorithm for uh, radiant interferometric imaging. We'll also discuss the presence of, of DDEs. So let me acknowledge the fact that the, the research I'm going to talk about is, is, of course, collaboration with my postdoc, Rafael Carillo, and, and, and Jason, who's there for us. OK. So the overview of the presentation is, is as follows. I'm, I'm going to build on uh, uh, Jason's introduction on, on compressive sampling, but um, discuss about the evolution of the theory towards the introduction of coherent and redundant sparsity dictionaries. Uh, versus the, 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 the autonomous basis that we considered beforehand that relates to uh, Sanjay's questions. If I, if I was right, I did identifying Sanjay asking about it earlier. We'll then uh, move to Sarah, the algorithm. And in a third part, uh, probe Sarah for Fourier imaging, which is, of course, of interest for all of us in, in radio inflammatory. And in the last part, uh, perform imaging in the presence of, of DDEs, back to spread spectrum considerations, actually. So after a very small bio dessert, uh, if we have some time, um, we'll, we'll move to a very short conclusion and take on message. So compressive sampling with redundant coherent dictionaries. I'm going to um, uh, browse this slide uh, quite rapidly as we had this introduction of compressive sampling. So uh, the signal of interest is x in the form of a vector of size n. Um, the, its representation in, in some dictionary, as we say, or redundant basis is alpha. The dictionary it can be a concatenation of basis of frames or etc. So it's really not an autonomous basis anymore. It's, it's um, um, it's a fat matrix, right? Like the one you see, matrix psi. Okay, so alpha is now a representation in this sparsity dictionary. Uh, this representation is of size d, where d is now much bigger potentially than n itself, right? The representation is is um, much higher dimensional than the signal itself, but it is assumed to have some sparsity k, which, which is uh, much smaller than, than n, right? And so we are sensing the signal through some, again, fat matrix, m times n matrix, with m the number of linear measurements. We have uh, id, gas, and noise in the basic setting, and, and so this, this sets our elbows into this problem. y equals phi x plus n. Uh, this didn't change, right? What The only thing that, that um, changes here is that we consider uh, the, 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 the evolution of a theory for a fat uh, sparsity matrix, which will allow us to be more flexible about the, the definition of the sparsity basis. So some technicalities. Um, uh, first, the definition. I mean, compressed sensing relies on uh, the requirement that uh, our sensing matrices satisfy some technical property called a restricted isometry property. And here we have a, 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 a D restricted isometry property, uh, uh, which applies for uh, redundant dictionaries. And this restricted isometry just says that uh, if you take a signal that has uh, an expansion on k atoms of the dictionary, that's x indexed by k, and apply the measurement matrix phi, um, then, then this matrix more or less preserves the L2 norm of the signal, hence uh, uh, restricted isometry uh, property. Okay. So now, if this rip is satisfied, uh, uh, the, this evolution of the theory for redundant dictionary says that the minimization problem, which is written in the middle of the page uh, uh, here, uh, will provide a robust reconstruction. So. We still have uh, this problem saying you minimize an L1 prior subject to uh, an L2 norm constraint. And this L2 norm constraint is, is, the, is a constraint on the residual noise between your model and, and uh, your, your data. So it's if you want to constrain on, on your chi-square. Um, 
so this is this is the way all um, compressed sensing algorithm works, and and this is what you can also do, of course, uh, with clean. If you don't want to stop on a number of, of iterations, you, you would like first to meet uh, a criterion, which is um, that uh, the L two norm is bounded by uh, the norm of the noise, right? So maybe to relate to the question of uh, Urvashi earlier, I mean, this is the first characterization of, of the kind of errors you, you can have. You are entitled to satisfy uh, this chi-square constraint anyway, right? Now, let's go back to the prior. We have here the L1 norm, because that's the, the, the convex relaxation of the L0 norm explicitly promoting sparsity of psi transpose x. We could have had the L1 norm of alpha, which is the representation, right? But that's very different. Uh, the minimization problem that is proposed by this evolution of compressed sensing is called analysis-based. This means that you solve for the signal itself. The dimensionality of, of the problem remains n, right? Of course, you ask that you have sparsity in psi, reason why you ask to minimize the, the L1 norm of psi transpose x, okay? Well, if you had uh, wanted to minimize uh, alpha, the L1 norm of alpha, you would have had a problem of dimensionality d much larger than n. So it gives you a reason why, already intuitively, you will go for uh, for an analysis-based problem rather than the so-called standard synthesis-based problem, which would have solved for the representation of the signal itself, right? And this problem is shown to, to have uh, robust uh, reconstruction characteristics. Uh, this, again, relates to, to to Urvashi's question characterizing the kind of errors here. You have, a, you have this stability results that says that the, the, the L2 norm discrepancy between the true signal x and the reconstruction x star is bounded by the sum of two terms. Uh, one of them is, is related to epsilon, a bound on the noise level, and the second one is related to the L1 norm, if you want, on what we call the compressibility tail of the signal. Meaning if the signal is exactly sparse, then this term disappears, right? And if there is no noise, the term disappears too, and you have exact reconstruction. In a realistic setting, you have noise, and uh, you don't have exact sparsity, uh, which means that uh, you have errors, but you control these errors uh, according to, uh, to, to this relation. Something I didn't uh, really talk about, and, and I'm going to skip that more or less, is the coherence of the dictionary. So let's not mix everything. It's not about the coherence between sparsity and sensing matrices. There you need incoherence. But as soon as you jump to redundant sparsity dictionaries, the theory asks you that you go for a sparsity dictionary, which is internally coherent. Uh, this coherence, if you want, is asking uh, for sparsity of the Gramian matrix psi transpose psi, right? This all comes because psi is not orthonormal anymore, so psi transpose psi is not uh, identity, okay? And uh, this will ensure that if alpha is sparse and x is psi alpha, then the representation of x, which is given by psi transpose x, that is psi transpose psi alpha is, you know, not so different from alpha itself, right? If alpha is sparse, then psi transpose psi alpha will also be sparse. That's just, let's just take it as a comment. Again, the theory would not be uh, very interesting if it were not providing you with ways for uh, uh, building sensing matrices which will satisfy uh, these requirements. And again, uh, you can build matrices uh, with, which look like Gaussian noise or Bernoulli random matrices, and they will satisfy the rib with overwhelming probability even with a small number of measurements. That the, that's the first point here on this slide number six, right? Uh, second thing which is of much greater interest for us here is that technically all, um, nearly all random matrices built by randomizing the column sign of a matrix satisfying the, the initial rip will satisfy the D rip for, for uh, this evolution of compressed sensing. That's slightly technical, but just the example here should uh, make it all clear. If you take the Fourier matrix and you randomize the column sign of that Fourier matrix and you take this as your sensing matrix, 
then this is a very good sensing uh, procedure in the context of uh, CS with redundant dictionaries. And this will just require you to take a number of measurements with scales aligned sparsity, and uh, which is actually independent of the sparsity basis that you consider. So, but Fourier matrix and randomizing signs is exactly the spread spectrum acquisition procedure. So we show here that spread spectrum is also optimal and universal, universal that is independent of the sparsity basis of interest for redundant sparsity dictionaries. And as it was uh, highlighted uh, many times already and, and, and earlier today by, by Jason, spread spectrum is good. And in radiant geometry, W component gives you the spread spectrum phenomenon. But it's not just about W, it's about any kind of modulation in real space. So if you have DDEs, which have some, some wide uh, uh, spectrum, then they will play the exact same role. In Fourier, they will induce a convolution, which spreads your spectrum and is very good in terms of optimizing the acquisition. So even though all this talk is about uh, uh, you know, developing a new reconstruction algorithm for, from given data. As we already insisted on, uh, CS is primarily about designing the optimal acquisition, right? And we had a, a very nice talk uh, from Tobia earlier uh, this morning. And here, just just to say that if if we can get a, a bit more of some spread spectrum phenomenon, then let's be happy about this. Let's not try it to annihilate the W components and then remove DDE effects, even though, of course, you need to calibrate the DDEs, and that's very difficult. But if you have Ws and DDEs, we are happy uh, from, from an information theoretic viewpoint, even though, practically, this makes things uh, more complicated, right? So this was uh, for, for the kind of sensing uh, that, that well, we can have in on which we might have, uh, you know, some some influence uh, when we design our our telescopes and our experiments. So Sarah, the algorithm for reconstructing uh, given uh, given a given set of data, Fourier or spread spectrum data. One is actually often left with a difficult choice uh, uh, about finding the best sparsity basis because we acknowledge the fact that. Uh, you know, there is certainly a basis where our signal is more sparse than, than in another basis. But often, uh, the signals of interest are sparse in, in various kinds of bases. It's kind of sparse in Dirac. It's very sparse in some wavelet bases. Maybe it's sparse also in the magnitude of its gradient. So we conjecture here that natural signals exhibit a very strong, small, average sparsity over multiple coherent frames, that is multiple bases if you want. So the only thing we do is add each of those bases as a prior. And the only thing you have to do in the previous problem is consider psi to be the concatenation of frames or the concatenation of bases, let's say, uh, say Q bases, right? As, as, as you see on slide number eight. So if you consider there the analysis prior as promoted by compressed sensing with redundant dictionaries, which consists in, in, in the L0 norm of psi transpose x with the psi that was uh, 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 given before, this is nothing else than the sum, or if you want the average, of the L0 norm of psi transpose bx, that is the sum of the sparsities in each of the representations, in each of the bases, right? So this is really uh, promoting average sparsity. Now, an important comment relating to analysis or synthesis, this is an analysis-based prior, and average sparsity uh, cannot be promoted by a synthesis-based prior. Because in synthesis, again, you would want to solve for alpha, right? And alpha is just the concatenation of the representation of the signal in each of the bases separately, right? So if you solve for alpha, actually your procedure will, will consist in, in for, for signal recovery, will consist in doing what we call usually component separation. You end up assuming that your signal is the sum of components, is the sum of signals, and each of those signals 
is passed in one of the bases, psi1 to psi q, right? So you will synthesize each of those signals, and you will average those signals to give, uh, to give your signal x. But this is very different, and we go to slide 9, um, very different from, from uh, the analysis-based prior promoting average sparsity. So, so there I highlighted the fact that analysis priors uh, are, are really important for sparsity averaging. The second point is that instead of just solving an L1 minimization problem, which is the simplest reg uh, regularized, sorry, the simplest um, convex relaxation of L0, we will go for what is called the reweighting scheme, which consists in solving sequentially weighted L1 problems, where the weights are essentially the inverse of the signal values in, this, in the, the sparse representation. Uh, given at the, at the previous iteration. At convergence, this will allow us to see that, that the L1 norm will count 1 as soon as the signal is non-zero and 0 otherwise. So we are approaching the L0 norm actually much better than, than just uh, by, by going uh, to L1 minimization. This was proven, uh, uh, say, more empirically and the, the starts to be some, some theoretical considerations about this. So, our minimization problem is, let's minimize the L0 norm of psi transpose x subject to the standard data constraint. But psi is a, a concatenation of sparsity bases, and we reach L0 by a, a, a reweighting scheme. So, hence the name SERA, Sparsity Averaging Reweighted Analysis. I would love to take some time uh, for discussing uh, convex optimization algorithms and the, stru the generic structure of those algorithms. Um, uh, I won't have uh, so much time, but actually, I just want to say a, a few words. Conceptually, uh, those algorithms, and, and typically those in, in a, you know, in the class of algorithms uh, defined as uh, proximal splitting algorithms, are, are quite easy to understand. They rely on the definition of an operator, which is called the proximal operator, um, uh, which is just a generalization of a projection operator. So typically, you have a functional to minimize here, which is the sum of two terms, uh, an, an L1 norm and uh, a projection on an L2 ball. And you can show that the proximal operator associated to the L2 ball is nothing else than the geometrical projection on 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 the on the L2 ball, right? In 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 the data space, while the proximal operator associated to the L1 norm is nothing else than a soft thresholding operator. And the kind of uh, of algorithms we are using are just um, you know taking uh, an initialization and then applying s uh, subsequently. Um, uh, sequentially, sorry, uh, the proximal operators associated to each of the two sub-functions of interest, right? So you will apply uh, projection on the L2 ball and do sub-thresholding in sparsity space and then move back to, to some um, uh, projection on the L2 ball in data space, etc., etc. And, and you have fast convergent properties for this kind of algorithms. The very interesting thing here is that uh, convex optimization is extremely versatile. You can have the number of sub-functions uh, that you want. You can add a positivity constraint or any statistical prior. And it's always the same thing. You need to be able to compute the proximal operator of your convex function. And you, you will sequentially apply the proximal operator of each of the sub-functions to get to the solution. Right. So this was a small parenthesis uh, relating to, to some questions also earlier. So let's move to let's move sorry to free imaging with SARAM, you know the basic of what we'll want to do uh, for for radiant round trick imaging. So let's let's consider simulations for M31 and let's consider like this kind of Fourier mass uh, which are variable density sampling mass and and we have a, a, an illustration of uh, the kind of dirty images that that we get with that. So the dictionary that we consider is a concatenation here, you know, for psi, is a concatenation of Dirac, Haar, and Dobushi wavelet bases, right? The convex optimization is uh, solved through proximal splitting algorithms, uh, as just discussed. And we already adapt the algorithm because we had a positivity constraint, and we solved it 
again, uh, thanks to the versatility of context optimization. The results are quite clear here. Uh, we have a, a, an SNR uh, as a function of the, the coverage of the energy sampling, right, for uh, different kind of problems. First, you have a BP, which is the basis pursuit problem. Let's say this is really equivalent to clean promoting sparsity in direct space in blue. In Cyan, you have BP in Dobushi wavelet, so we, we assume we promote sparsity in an autonomous basis, uh, which is a, no, uh, a Dobushi wavelet basis. Um, in red, we have TV, that is, we promote TV minimization, that is, uh, gradient sparsity. Magenta is the undecimated wavelet transform uh, algorithm that was recently proposed uh, by, by Fengli. This is not an analysis based algorithm. This is not a constraint algorithm, that is, uh, it's minimizing the prior plus an L2 term and not the prior subject to uh, a, a bound on the L2 term, right? And then in black, uh, you have Sarah. So, I mean, for M31, uh, the, the, the quality of the reconstruction of Sarah, you see their uh, average uh, SNRs with one sigma error bars is, is, is uh, quite amazing uh, with nearly 5 dB about all of the state of the art, right? So, in terms of illustrations, on the left hand side, uh, you have a reconstruction with 30% sampling. Uh, affected by uh, 30 dB of noise. The first image is BB reconstruction, nearly 33 dB. You have on the middle the error image, really the difference between the ground truth and the reconstruction. And on the right hand side, the residual dirt image, which is less interesting for us than the error image because it's, it's characterizing uh, you know, the discrepancy between your model and your data. Right, just uh, accounting for where you measured free coefficients, while the error image is really accounting for 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 the the complete error that you make compared to the ground truth. Um, slide fourteen, uh, you have BP in Dobushi wavelets, so this increases uh, uh, the 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 SNR, and you see the error image and the residual image, which which also uh, improve. So this is like uh, uh, one version of multi-scale cleaning, right? Now, the undecimated wavelet transform doesn't give here so very good uh, SNRs. Uh, the residual dirty image is very good, but again, the error image is, is, is not so good. TV here is actually not working bad in terms of SNR, but it's providing uh, quite a bunch of artifacts, and you see that uh, in terms of the of the error image, so this is not known from TV that you um, that you 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 get good SNRs, but actually you, you get uh, artifacts, piecewise constant artifacts, and you have Sarah, Sarah, which moves the SNR towards 38, 39 dBs with an error image, which is uh, clearly uh, uh, better than than for uh, the other priors. Another illustration for the 30 Doradus uh, emission, uh, again at 30%. I don't show you the, the global SNR graphs. This is uh, more or less the same as for M31. Uh, we can see here the illustration for 30% sampling still affected by 30 dB of noise. This is the BP reconstruction with the, with the error image on the left, on, in the center, sorry. Uh, if you move to BP and Dobushi wavelets, you jump significantly in SNR and you see that the error image is better. Undecimated wavelet transform is actually not so good. Uh, you see it also in, in, in the error image. TV reconstruction uh, is, is uh, good in SNR. We are at 26 dBs, right? Uh, but again, you see artifacts there. And here's the SARA reconstruction, which is at 29 dBs. The error image is, is nearly flat. And this is also the case of the residual dirty image here. So this closes this uh, third part for imaging with Sarah uh, and uh, assuming Fourier acquisition. And now we'll move to imaging in the presence of DDEs in a very, I mean, generic and rudimentary way. We just assume we have uh, spread spectrum acquisition, which is our generic model uh, for including uh, DDEs, right? So just an illustration here for the sake of time. Uh, let's uh, consider the sinus A uh, galaxy. And, and we here consider 15% spread spectrum sampling affected by 30 dBs of noise. 
uh, slide 25, we have uh, BP reconstruction. You see that the air image, I'm not showing anymore the residual uh, dirty images. The air image is, is, is not so good. I mean, you see the artifacts of assuming sparsity in direct space. And the estimated wavelet transform uh, is, is good. It moves the SNR to 30 dBs, right? Uh, you, you, the, the error image is much better, but you clearly see artifacts. Uh, BP in, in Dobushi wavelets uh, it, it is again increasing the SNR significantly and the quality of imaging. TV uh, is not so good. Again, you see artifacts, and you, you would have known from scratch that uh, this kind of emission uh, is not really uh, TV sparse. It's, it's, it's smoother than piecewise constant. Now, here's Terra. For spread spectrum acquisition, you get like 40 dBs. You, you, you recover uh, slightly better the jet between the two parts of the image that you had lost for any of the other priors. And the error image is, is amazingly flat. Right? So our bio dessert, um, if I still have time, I hope so. Nobody is stopping me, so that's great. It's just going to last for two more minutes, no more. Um, I mean, we are interested in, in applying uh, this kind of things in, in other fields, and some of you know my interest for biomedical imaging, in particular for, for magnetic resonance imaging. And there, I mean, we are probing signals through uh, Fourier or, or even uh, spread spectrum uh, acquisitions. And, and you have on the left hand side uh, an original slice of a brain image. And uh, what we are trying to do is reduce the sampling as much as possible because this turns out to be equivalent to acceleration of the MR scans, and this is extremely important uh, in, in clinics. Uh, we are, we are, I'm just giving you an illustration of what you can get with 20-fold acceleration of the scan, which is way beyond the state of the art uh, in, in, in the field of accelerated MRI today, and with, again, a 30 dB input noise. So this is the Sarah reconstruction, and just for um, for um, comparison, we can flip between uh, slice 31 and 32. You see the second best reconstruction among all the priors that we had tested before. This is the TV reconstruction, which is significantly worse. Right? You see in the piecewise constant artifacts. Just let's let's move to our simple conclusion in the form of a small take-home message. So Sarah supersedes clearly from our simulations uh, uh, the state-of-the-art reconstruction algorithm for compressive imaging. The, the, the algorithm is uh, completely defined in the framework of compressed sensing with rhythm dictionaries. Um, it, it supersedes the state-of-the-art both in terms of SNR and in terms of visual quality and for various kinds of, of acquisition procedures from Fourier to spread spectrum acquisitions which correspond to um, a generic uh, consideration but uh, imaging in the presence of directional dependent effects. So uh, current work focuses on studying evolution of SARA. I'm not going to uh, say more about this and certainly on implementing the algorithm for realistic pipelines and their JSON uh, made uh, great work discussing this uh, for you earlier, and this relates to our forthcoming purified code. So um, I'm going to stop here. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was audible, and, and I'm very sorry I couldn't be there. I, I just didn't make it. Thank you very much. The, the I'm happy to take any questions, of course. Okay, so can you hear me? I don't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I hear something, but... Could you just say something about how the algorithm scales with the you know, number of pixels, essentially, the number of bases that you have? Say, if you had images of the order of, say, yeah, 10,000 by 10,000, would that work? 100,000 by 100,000? Yeah, so uh, this was uh, here simulations which were performed um, with MATLAB for 256, 256 images. I, uh, on purpose, didn't show you the, the, um, the timing results that we had there because uh, now with Purify, they are completely uh, superseded. And typically, 
applying Sarah on a 256, 256 image with like nine, the concatenation of nine or ten sparsity bases um, takes less than a second. So it, it obviously scales very nicely uh, to, to larger images, but it was not yet explicitly tested to uh, the size of images you, you are going to be interested in for, for typically SKA and, and for hyperspectral imaging, etc. Uh, still, I mean, less than a second for these images is, is, uh, is, is very good compared to the state of the art and compared to what you, what you have with other priors. Does this answer your question? Because you didn't say how it scales. No question. No question. How much time it takes for a particular instance? How it scales on top of the image? I mean, the the most important uh, thing is um, how costly is your uh, measurement operator. So it just scales uh, with. Uh, the same way as your FFT transform scale. Uh, unless you also have DDEs, then it depends on how you implement the DDEs, and this goes back to considerations about the W projection algorithm. And basically, what you try to have after the Fourier transform there is a sparse matrix. So uh, th that's the question about uh, how fast is, is your sparse matrix. But uh, in the simple case where you have uh, um, uh, Fourier imaging, this would scale in the same way as an FFT. Does this better answer the question? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I noticed um, when you were referring to the uh, data completeness and referring to 10%, and this was also true in Jason's talk, of, of going up from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. And I assume that is probably randomly missing information or randomly including information in, in the measurement plane. Um, I just, uh, well, first of all, part A is, is that the case? Is this uh, randomly uh, located data or missing data? And if so, how does it change if it's not so random, but rather more systematic gaps in the data, uh, specifically around the origin, if it's uh, in the Fourier domain, as well as more systematic gaps moving away from the origin? I just wonder how that impacts um, the whole problem. Well, I can't give you uh, quantitative assessments there, and that's really what we, the move that we are doing now. Uh, indeed, uh, all what I have been showing it is from random sampling, and indeed, we need to confirm all that when uh, you know for different kinds of of, of patterns uh, in Fourier, which would be much more directly related to uh, to uh, telescope configuration. So I think uh, Jason showed. Uh, uh, reconstruction from continuous samples from a, from a, a, um, an Amy uh, configuration. You see, I mean that that uh, everything, all our conclusions tend to to hold, right? But I agree that random sampling is a kind of uh, optimal consideration here. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, this is Sanjay. Very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, I have a, I have Two related questions. One is, uh, in Sarah, what what was the basis functions that you did you use? And secondly, were they uh, basically a set of pre-computed fixed basis functions that you used to represent the image? So the basis functions, I said that on slide twenty. No, on slide which slide? Sorry. Thirteen, no, twelve, eleven. So uh, the dictionary here uh, for this illustration was a concatenation of Dirac bases, Ha wavelet bases, and uh, different uh, Dobushi wavelet bases uh, of order two to eight. So these are well-known, very generic uh, wavelet bases for which you can find uh, either MATLAB or, or, or C implementations uh, uh, anywhere, right? Uh, uh, th but this is, you know, this is for uh, first illustration. This this is shown to work uh, 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 quite well. You you may want to add uh, another basis if you have, uh, you know, an intelligent idea. And 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 uh, so this is really flexible. But what is uh, already amazing for us is that, that you know, 
say, the most rudimentary or the most stupid concatenation of, of the most simple web bases gives us uh, such uh, amazing results. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. OK, let's thank Eve again. And then uh, we'll uh, the last uh, 